An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 14, July 10th, 1958. Ladies and Gentlemen, in the last session, we discussed the dialectical criticism of the principle which demands analysis of a problem into its most basic elements. It is evident that I certainly did not mean to suggest that we should somehow avoid analyzing an object. On the contrary, we must do so. For every kind of attempt to determine what is given simultaneously implies a certain limitation or qualification and to that extent indeed already inevitably involves emphasizing certain moments. While the mere identification of an abstract totality is not just inadequate, but ultimately not even possible. If I try and apply the dialectical mode of thinking here, I can almost say that any attempt to grasp the whole at all by denominating it in some way already includes an analytical aspect insofar as we do not simply stop or rest content with this totality, but relate it to certain conceptual determinations which cannot, in any immediate sense, be simply the same as the whole, but must rather bring out some specific moments of the latter. Having said this, I think I may be able to make even clearer to you what I was, already, what I was really driving at with this critique of the analytical method. For it is essentially a critique of the fetishism of ultimate elements, from a certain perspective, we may say that dialectical operations of thought do not signify alterations in the intellectual processes we actually perform in knowing something, so much as alterations in the interpretations we furnish in this regard. In a specific sense, dialectic is nothing but the critical attempt to resolve the philo philo oh, philosophemes. <laughs> philosophemes? with which, unless and until we think and intervene here in a really radical way, we tend to rationalize and in considerable, me considerable measure to misinterpret our own activity of cognition. The essential thing I want to say here is that we should not believe that we have already taken, we, are, we have already done justice to the matter itself just because we have accepted the necessity of analyzing a whole in order to comprehend it. We should not believe that our cognitive demands, for which a whole is not immediately given but is accessible only as mediated through conceptual operations, and thus necessarily is differentiated into, into particular moments which have been conceptually discriminated in terms of characteristic unified features, have already fully determined the matter itself. I think it is especially important to recognize this with regard to the process of knowledge today, for specifically in our contemporary situation, subjected as we are to the demands of administrative and bureaucratic thought, demands which today make themselves felt even within the most subtle stirrings of spirit. There is an enormous temptation to identify the analytic process of knowing which we perform with knowledge itself. It is as if we considered the process of the division of labor from which indeed the analytic resolution of the process of knowledge into its elements is directly derived, as the late Franz Borkano has shown, and conflated this expression of the division of labor, i.e. a specific way of organizing the process of knowing with a determination of the matter itself, so that we imagine that these moments of our knowing expressing the division of labor are simply the same as the determinations of the matter we are attempting to know. I believe I can clarify this with a concept which will, which will be familiar to you from the practice of the sciences, and especially those sciences which somewhat emphatically describe themselves as empirical sciences. The concept to which I want to draw your attention here is that of analysis into specific factors and especially into laws. We encounter it repeatedly, for example, in the work of someone like Mannheim, who is hardly unaware of epistemological theoretical issues, but even in that of Marx, when they distinguish universal factors from particular ones, as though the universal factor would exercise its own effect, while certain specific effective forces or specific effective laws, as they are described, would also additionally come into play.
we meet with this kind of procedure, which distinguishes between universal factors and additional, more specific factors in this way, wherever one attempts in a broad sense to identify such things as motivations or causal relationships within the domain of the social sciences. But there is no question that we thereby easily succumb to the temptation to hypostasize the products of our mechanisms of abstraction, of our ways of conceptually organizing the material, treating these products as if they were essentially the same as the matter itself. Thus, when it is claimed to choose an example from Marx's theory, that something like the relationship between classes provides an explanation for social processes, and we then further take account of the specific conditions which arise from free wage labor and the exchange of labor power as a commodity within capitalist society, it looks as if, on the basis of this conceptual schema, firstly, that the world has until now been a world of class struggle, secondly, that we live in the particular period of capitalist society. We can derive two series of factors, as it were, the universal factors and the special factors, and all we need to do is to bring these together in order to explain the phenomenon in question. And if I express it in this way, it may perhaps strike you as so naive and absurd that you cannot really understand all the effort I am making to criticize this mode of thought here. But I would seriously ask you not to underestimate the temptation which always arises from the imposition of such organizing principles whenever you are expected to provide some conceptual organization for the relevant phenomenon which is um, under investigation. There is something uncommonly seductive about this procedure for the scientific investigator who undertakes to classify the material that presents itself, who is indeed required to compare his or her findings, to bring the same things together under the relevant concepts, to distinguish different things in different or in terms of different concepts, just as we learn to do in the practical context of scientific research. But in truth, it is naturally otherwise, for the dynamic laws to which modern capitalist society is subject, for example, are not a universal laws regarding classes, and then b further laws regarding the specific form of the currently prevailing relation between classes. Rather, the fundamental fact here is that society until now has been riven within itself, has not been identical with itself, that society bears a certain dynamic within itself a quite specific sort of dynamic, which comes to manifest itself historically, or which finds its concrete historical expression in the class relations that prevail in capitalist society. That is, in a society of free wage labor, where the exchange principle has unfolded in universal form. It would be quite wrong to try and discover, over and beyond this determination, some further universal law to which the phenomena in question would be subject, for this universal factor itself is mediated through the specific situation in which we exist and, in a sense, manifests itself only in a specific form. Here, too, we must attempt to think this through in a properly differentiated manner. Thus, it is entirely meaningful to say that there has always been such a thing as exploitation, such a thing as the appropriation of other people's labor, such a thing as exchange, and where indeed the weaker party always draws the short straw in the process of exchange. But it is not the case that this invariant factor, which has always existed and which still exists, should be regarded as something in addition to its merely logical form of specification, for it is developed in precisely this specific form. In other words, if we are really serious about the concept of the self-developing movement of the matter itself, which is indeed, after everything we have heard, a fundamental requirement of dialectical thought, that the notion of some such invariance independent of the concrete forms which it assumes in the course of development effectively loses its meaning. Thus, we can say that all this applies to a world where there are classes and where there is exploitation, but it is not as if there were certain general laws for this, and then in addition, there were also specific laws which apply to the current situation. Rather, it is the essence of these laws themselves that they unfold into the laws which hold for the current situation. Of course, it is also quite possible, and this is a problem which is very important for all material dialectic, uh, 
for the content of dialectical thought that certain elements of the past may continue to survive in a particular historical situation. Thus, to a considerable extent, it has come about in Europe, in countries such as Germany and pre-revolutionary Russia, which are said to have developed rather late, that all sorts of feudal remnants have persisted within the context of the bourgeois principle, and where in turn quite particular forms of class relations are also expressed. But then they are not representatives of some more general class relation with respect to the particular class relation which currently prevails. Rather, they simply represent a stage of previous historical processes that have survived. Perhaps I can use this opportunity to say a few words about the position of dialectic with regard to the concept of development more generally. And this brings me directly to a question which perhaps possesses a certain significance for the way we construe the idea of development itself. Dialectical thought, which works in terms of contradictions and reversals, is necessarily opposed to the notion of an even or simply continuous development. That the processes in question, and here we are talking about all, we are talking above all about historical processes, are internally contradictory. That they consist precisely in the unfolding of contradictions is what already excludes the idea of some even and seamless progress just as it excludes, in turn, the idea of social stat stasis or invariance. In relation to historical reality, it may specifically be one of the deepest insights open to dialectical thought that it need not regard the non-simultaneous character of what is lagged behind, it still persists si simply as an obstacle upon the smooth path of historical progress. <clears throat> Rather, it is capable of recognizing what for its own part resists or cannot comfortably be accommodated within this so-called progress in grasping it in terms of the principle of development itself. If the idea of dialectic does indeed possess a temporal core, as we have tried to show here, this means that it is also essentially a dialectic of non-simultaneous aspects, namely a dialectic which must also try to understand in terms of ongoing temporal development precisely what has, if you like, proved unable to keep pace, historically speaking. Thus, if we can observe, observe certain reactionary currents within the petty bourgeoisie, currents which then came to play such an extraordinarily significant role in the emergence of fascism itself in Germany, we shall not be able to regard these persisting elements simply as vestiges or remnants within the historical process. Rather, we should have to confront the paradoxical and eminently dialectical task of deriving what is lagged behind precisely, <clears throat> if I may express this in a very extreme fashion, by reference to the movement of progress itself. In other words, the path of progress involves a process in which certain human groups find themselves dispossessed, groups which certainly belong in terms which certainly belong in terms of their origin and ideology to the realm of bourgeois society, but which now suddenly forfeit the material basis of precisely this bourgeois existence to which both their history and their ideology points. Thus, these human groups, which are acquainted with materially and ideologically preferable form of life, or have experienced the possibility of such a life, and which in comparison with the past can expect nothing good rightly or wrongly, from further changes in society, are turned into laudatoris temporis acti, by the path of progress itself, by the process of historical development, that is, into people who seek salvation in the past and whose consciousness is turned backwards to earlier phases of development. And this regressive tendency of their consciousness is then very easily combined with the strongest social forces, which for their part negate the usual conception of progress, since this conception of progress is a bourgeois one in the genuine sense, one that is bound up with notions of liberality and individual freedom. These forces, for reasons which we cannot go into here, like to appeal specifically to authoritarian forms of rule, and here they are able to use this regressive feature on the part of certain very large groups which have come to depend on them. To this extent, we might say, therefore, that precisely the most reactionary aspects of national socialism, 
such as the notion of blood and earth, the racial theories, and all these things which are connected with a spurious cult of origins, in a certain sense were themselves actually functions of dynamic social change, of social progress, if you want to put it that way, namely of the increased power of large-scale industrial production. And the task of a dialectical theory of society must always consist in refusing to regard what is not kept pace, what is lagged behind in a simply static fashion. That is, as something which has simply lagged behind, which is now opposed to change and movement. For if the extremes are indeed as reciprocally mediated as I have attempted to make clear to you, then the static and the dynamic dimensions are themselves mediated with one another here. That is to say, the supposedly static sectors of society must actually be derived from the dynamic trajectory at work. I think it will be useful for you to grasp this point clearly, and it will enable you to form a very precise idea of the difference between dialectical and non-dialectical thinking here. A non-dialectical sociology would say something like the following, as Mannheim and others have indeed actually said. On the one side, there are certain dynamic, mobile, and progressive groups, namely those involved in finance, capital, and to a certain extent in industry, especially manufacturing industry and the like. And then by contrast, there are also static, progressive, and conservative groups, such as the peasantry, and society simply consists in the way the static and dynamic factors yield a kind of mixture. And the result of these static and dynamic factors then constitute the history which we have to accept as ours. This conception is fundamentally superficial and undialectical, for what it fails to grasp is not so much the eminent degree to which the dynamic process of history also bears elements of the past within itself. Everyone will concede that. Everyone will concede that, but rather and above all the reverse, the fact that the static and persisting aspects are actually functions of dynamic principles. <clears throat> I might perhaps also draw your attention to another phenomenon in this connection, that of the family. The family is indeed a natural form of association, one that actually contradicts the universal principle of exchange. In other words, the things which individual family members accomplish for one another within the family cannot simply be expressed in terms of exchange relations. You find this above all in circumstances where in a certain sense the family is still actually involved with the material process of production, namely in the country where the peasant family still functions as labor power and where in fact, to a considerable degree, these very small economic units are able to maintain their life at all, only because, from an objective economic perspective, the labor of the family is undercompensated. It is very easy to say that the family is like an island of irrationality, of merely natural growth, of mere traditionalism, within an otherwise thoroughly rationalized world, as if in the shape of the family the feudal past still somehow reached into our world. As indeed, in an emphatic sense, there is something feudal about the concept of the family. However matters stand in this regard, here too it would be a superficial view of things to believe that the family has persisted simply as a kind of remnant within an otherwise fully developed exchange society. Rather, we must ask ourselves how it is actually possible that the family should survive at all in spite of the constantly increasing degree of rationalization. For the moment, I would like to ignore the fact as various sociologists, such as Shelsky or, with a somewhat different emphasis, Beaumere, have shown that the family itself is currently undergoing a process of restructuring and effectively forfeiting more and more of its natural and, if you like, its pre-capitalist features. But even in the context of these modifications, the family as such still retains a pre-capitalist in character. The answer to this question, it seems to me, does not really lie in the notion that something like the family possesses a kind of greater resistance in this regard, and indeed, one may question whether such a power of resistance is really so great within any individual family. And anyone who knows anything about psychology also knows how problematic the unity of the family is, 
and just how much material for potential conflict for everyone involved the family invariably brings with it. Rather, in order to understand this archaic and, ana and anachronistic character of the family, which has survived within our own society, it seems necessary to bear in mind what our society, for all its rationality, itself remains irrational. That is to say, it continues to stand under the law of profit rather than one which prescribes the satisfaction of human needs, and this same irrationality also causes or compels society to maintain certain irrational um, sectors within it, within itself. For at the point where the bourgeois principle of bourgeois society would be fully realized, would be utterly and completely rationalized, their bourgeois society, we might almost say, would cease to be a bourgeois society at all, at all because there would then no longer be any place for precisely those moments which provide the motivation of economic activity in this society. Thus, insofar as a progressively rationalized society is still bound to the irrational and arbitrary control over the labor of others, it is thereby also necessarily and inevitably dependent upon the survival of irrational institutions of the most various kinds. Thus, while on, on the one hand, these institutions are indeed in, in anachronism within bourgeois society, they are, on the other hand, also required by bourgeois society itself, and we may suspect that the more purely and completely bourgeois society realizes its own principle, the more it will require such irrational institutions as the family, the only one that I have specifically emphasized here. We could also point to other, and in our time probably much more powerful and influential institutions in this regard. You will perhaps have seen from this that the notion of analyzing something into its constituent elements may prove extremely dangerous, even in simply conceptual terms. Thus, were you to analyze our society, for example, into elements, starting with the larger economic units, then taking the smaller economic units, then the smallest and not wholly rationalized kinds of association, such as the family, and then all other possible institutions, you might conceive of society as a whole as a sort of map, which is made up by the way all these moments fit together. But such an image of social reality would be literally false, for society is not composed out of these elements. Rather, these elements for their own part stand within a highly complex self-conditioning functional context, for which I have attempted to develop a brief schema for you here. And you will perhaps have seen from this schema that this context is actually better described as one mediated by social antagonisms than as one of wholeness, as people love to say, or as a so-called organic social context. For if there is such a thing as society, it is far more like a system than an organism, albeit a system of disparate moments, a system which is essentially self-contradictory in character. The next rule of Descartes that we wish to consider is one that concerns continuity. This third rule was to carry on my reflections in due order, commencing with objects that were the most simple and easy to understand, in order to rise little by little, or by degrees, to knowledge of the most complex, assuming an order, even if a fictitious one, among those which do not follow a natural uh, sequence relatively to one another. The last qualifying remark clearly betrays an emphatically rationalistic motif here, namely the notion of assuming a certain order as a kind of working hypothesis. In other words, in order to render something like a scientific order possible, one must presuppose that a seamless and continuous form of order already characterizes the object to be known. For if I did not make this assumption, I would not really in all conscience be able to build up any scientific order at all. In this regard, Descartes still shows the kind of impressive honesty which is peculiar to the earliest and to the final phases of such a development, for he clearly expresses the as-if character of this assumption here whereas subsequent philosophers, beginning with Spinoza, and not excluding my own Hegel in this respect, would far rather ascribe directly and dogmatically to things themselves that which Descartes still quite openly describes as a rational ordering principle. After what we have heard, I think we can now see that the path of gradual step-by-step -step and continuous knowledge cannot claim unconditional validity as such.
at least of our reflections on dialectical contradiction contradiction are to the point. The step-by-step procedure is one we are familiar with in the natural sciences and in the traditional forms of applied science, above all when the science in question deals with an object which has been so deprived of qualitative features, so reduced to qualitatively indistinguishable moments, that the determinations of the object itself are irrelevant to us here in comparison with the determinations that we confer on it through our ordering principles. But given what we have tried to show about the contradictory character of the object of knowledge itself, we hardly need to say that such continuity cannot actually be presupposed. And from this point of view, from the perspective of the question of continuity and discontinuity, which is incidentally the fundamental problem or one of the fundamental problems of Leibniz, one of the greatest rationalist philosophers. Oh no. There we go. The principle or the problem of dialectic would be not simply to insist upon the moment of discontinuity, but rather to connect the moment of discontinuity and, or sorry, the moments of continuity and discontinuity with one another, namely to grasp con- continuity and discontinuity themselves as reciprocally mediated. I have already put it to you that our society is more of a system than an organism, and that it is nonetheless an antagonistic society. Perhaps this alerts you to the dialectical problem that I would particularly particularly like to draw to your attention in the present context. On the one hand, the theoretical task of dialectic is specifically to comprehend the whole or totality and knowledge is not possible without the idea of a totality. Yet, on the other hand, this totality itself is not continuous in character, is not a logical totality totality within seamless deductive context. Rather, to put it bluntly, the totality is internally discontinuous in character, and the dialectical response to the problem which arises here is none other than to recognize that the unity of the society we live in is actually constituted shit constituted through sorry it just changed page like randomly through its okay and the dialectal and the dialectical response to the problem which arises here is none other than to recognize that that the unity of the society we live in is actually constituted through its very discontinuity In other words, the dissociated and discontinuous moments of the object of knowledge, insofar as they are related to one another as contradictions, rather than being simply disparate from one another, come precisely through this relationship, which they all make up together to crystallize specifically into that whole, which should properly constitute the object of knowledge here. It follows from this moment of discontinuity, incidentally, that our initial cognitive approach The point where we decide to begin is in one sense a matter of indifference for dialectical thought, for we do not presume, of course, that we can develop everything from an absolute first in some purely continuous fashion. Rather, it is the power of the whole, of which we have spoken already, which makes itself felt, as it were, in the same way in every individual moment. We might say, if you like, that everything is equally close to the centre, which is why any truly consistent dialectical thought can begin from what looks like the most obscure and ephemeral of phenomena, and indeed this is often the best course to take since it is precisely those things that have not yet been saturated by the official categories of thought, which may lead us most readily into the concealed essence of the whole, far more so than if we orient our thought in terms of established and already approved categories. We may also express this by saying, and this brings me to a material critique of traditional thought, that the problem of the position of thought towards objectivity becomes a moral problem in the light of the question of continuity or discontinuity. For the idea that the object of knowledge is itself something wholly coherent and consistent that may be logically explicated without remainder always involves the notion that what is articulated in such meaningful and consistent terms is effectively something positive. But if we are really in earnest with our critique of the existent, that is, 
if we take the thought of the antagonistic character of reality itself really seriously, then we are specifically bound to exhibit the discontinuity that characterizes the existent. And we are thereby driven to lend this character of separation and discontinuity to our own thought as well, but to do so in such a way that the unity and interconnectedness of what we are actually dealing with is revealed precisely through the discontinuity, precisely through this internally mediated contradiction in the matter itself. There is absolutely no question that productive thinking today can take the form only of one that, that works through breaks and fractures, whereas any thinking which is simply oriented in advance to unity, synthesis, and harmony can only serve to conceal something which thinking is called upon to penetrate, for it then inevitably contents itself with simply reproducing or even reinforcing the facade of what is already there in the medium of thought. Um, in the medium of thought. And if your own thinking, as long as your approach, has not entirely been shaped in advance by standard scientific expectations, feels a certain resistance against what can commonly be described as pedantry, then I believe this cannot simply be regarded as the typical attitude of the youthful enthusiast who still needs to learn the importance of discipline. There is something such as intellectual discipline of course, but the intellectual discipline which people would instill in us usually amounts to a kind of hostility to things of the mind, that is to say, ends up by stunting or emasculating the productivity of thought, namely the relation of thought to its objects, and encouraging it instead to submit to certain regulated procedures. But in truth, there is no rule for thought other than that of freedom towards the object, as Hegel calls it. The discipline of thought is simply that of measuring itself against the matter itself, of doing as much justice to the matter itself as it possibly can. It is not that of imp imposing upon itself qua method, a rule which prescribes how it is to proceed, and then on the basis of this so-called demand for method ultimately renouncing thought itself. For to think in the richest sense is invariably to think in a way that is not methodically regulated. I have no intention here of encouraging an arbitrary appeal to entirely fortuitous hunches or insights. I simply wish to emphasize how thought must be capable of its own freedom, must, along with freedom towards the object, also possess freedom within itself. It cannot therefore just relinquish itself, so to speak, before the object, but must continually seek out relationships of some kind with the object relationships in which alone thought can find itself contented. Thought which is no longer capable of this will never be able to disclose its object. The pedantry of thought is the way it fails its relation to the matter itself, fails it for the sake of securing what one already has, for the sake of the small security of the private person, of the small individual. And as with the security of small private property, this form of pedantry is exposed to inflation to an especially high degree. In other words, it will always forfeit exactly this. It will always show itself most wretched, just where it believes it must maintain its current value. Thus, I believe that it is really essential to intellectual health if you are already engaged in disciplined scientific or academic work or wish to become so, that you always continue to retain a critical attitude to the moment of pedantry that attaches to the exclusively step-by-step -step procedure. For, of course, this step-by-step -step procedure immediately threatens to paralyze the productive power of thought, wherever thought actually rouses itself. And I beg you not to think I am being sentimental here. It is able to soar rather than simply proceed step-by-step. And a thought which can no longer soar is no more a thought than one which can do nothing but soar. And to this extent, I think the platonic notion that enthusiasm is a necessary moment of knowledge and of truth itself is not just a passing expression of a philosophical mood, a mere expression of intellectual style, but does indeed capture a necessary moment of the matter itself. When thought simply proceeds step by step, advancing in the smallest possible steps, it cannot avoid endlessly repeating what it has already known.
where thought can leap beyond what is merely given to it, what it already knows anyway and remains fully aware of this leap. It is able to go beyond what merely is and thereby precisely reveal its character as the mere existence. I am well aware I am well aware at this particular point that I may encounter certain objections on your part, although I also hope that I have said enough about the positive moments of continuous forms of thought to protect myself in this regard, but I believe that precisely here, where we come to the really sensitive point at which dialectical thought is especially liable to provoke resistance, I should be prepared to speak in more detail in our next session about the specific nature of this resistance.